Um, and it's notable that uh, of the 1.3 trillion, uh, the least amount of money, almost the least, or towards the end, is uh, being spent on education and the top figure is on defense. Although I would ever to say that the real defense of our nation, of this realm, is in the hands of our student population. On that note, uh, let's introduce our guest this evening, uh, Dr. Indrajit Aponso, who is, of course, a, a senior lecturer at the University of Colombo. Uh, very good evening to you, uh, Indrajit. And, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a while since you've been on our program. Absolutely. Now then, I was uh, going to ask you, I know that uh, Parliament is, uh, will be debating the 1.3 trillion vote on account and so on. Um, but I want to ask you this. Is it fair to say that the real defense of our nation, the real security of our nation, is in the hands of tomorrow's Sri Lankan, meaning today's children, today's student? Is, is that about a fair statement? Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. Uh, well, if you really look at why these particular expenditures are sort of allocated in this way, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly why education is drawing attention uh, uh, much less than, for example, yeah. defense. We did have a history. <clears throat> we did have a history of security issues and various things that the defense comes into uh, play as a big uh, uh, expenditure. But we are now in a different phase. And that phase requires, as you quite rightly said, that phase requires a different kinds of army, a different kind of force. An army of educated Absolutely. citizens Absolutely. to take us forward. Absolutely. And uh, on top of that, we are currently in the face of what we call COVID, anti-market phenomenon, mm -hmm. which is basically uh, going against all economic predictions, not only in this country, not only in developing countries, but in all developed countries as well, which are equipped with cash, uh, various other resources, instruments, people, human resources and everything. So. Sri Lanka uh, uh, requires a different kind of a force to be uh, in the forefront to take it forward. Now then, uh, on that note, um, the, the stated aim of President uh, NGR Nanda Senegot, Habiraj Paksa, is that we will traverse from $4,000 per capita, or near about, it's gone down a little bit now, approximately 4000 to 12000 now, as you know, uh, there are 48 categories of various activities from manufacturing to services and this, that and the other, uh, broadly grouped into about four main categories. Out of these 48, where do you think, let's, if we were to pick, say, three things that will make sure the three most important things that will help us to go from 4 to 12? Well, if you really look at, I mean, every country has different strengths, what different about challenges. Sri Lanka? Coming to Sri Lankan situation, we had a history of uh, our challenges and our strengths as well. Now, if you go back to the plantations, you know, there was a sort of a strength as one particular commodity, mm -hmm. which was basically found in the entire economy. But then that was a bloody, that was a weakness as well. Mm. That weakness was very much a weakness that we are moving. What exactly was the weakness? The weakness is, you know, a no country can sustain uh, a, 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 you know, economic growth, which is the fundamental thing for any, uh, any situation where a country can uh, move from whatever the economic level that they are in yeah. to something that is what we call uh, income, high income levels, yeah. middle income you levels. You can't do that without? Without economic growth. Economic right. growth is basically creating wealth in the country. How, so what are the four, let's say three or four things that they need to invest in and how much would be my next question. 
What are the four areas that you would look, you would that would be a, that would be a very difficult question to answer directly as to which which particular sector will be the winners of uh, 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 that will take us to the next level of economic uh, uh, economic plateau. What we could see is on the on in the seventies, eighties, nineties. The one of the sectors that did well was garments, which, uh, on a way, in a way, had at least come forward to sort of provide yes, yes. that. But then, yeah. that was a weakness again, because we are only having one sector now. If you are talking about four sectors, yeah. that's not the way to look forward. You got to have a large base. Different things. You got to have a large base, and where. Sometimes you may not have the uh, big categories of 3 billion, 4 billion categories. You might have a large spectrum of goods and you have to keep on trying all that as well. And the current situation where the COVID has created a new uh, dimension or new horizons for any country and that is where the Sri Lankan opportunities might uh, uh, realize. Especially in yeah. the, uh, even the areas in agriculture where the no, no, much much is being made about uh, the need for us uh, to have our food security and, and therefore agriculture is like a hot topic. It's a, like a trending story, uh, to use the sort of modern terminology. How much more, what should, in numbers, should the government be investing in that sector? Well, government should not be investing uh, as such. You know, the, what is necessary, the government needs to create the environment where the people, or the private institutions and the farms, small SMEs in particular, will be encouraged to make their investments. And once those investments are going to take place, by the way, the agriculture is not be looking, uh, looked as a food security alone. Agriculture must be a foreign exchange earning sector. So not only for security of our country, but also for export. Not only for, it has to be transforming to something, because that's where we have one of the strengths as well. Right. You know, we have a large chunk of population which are in the agriculture. We, we already export tea, we already export cinnamon. We Those export. are traditional exports. Right. Those are traditional exports. I think we should be riding the wave with those traditional exports which have given us certain validity, certain credentials, certain recognition in the global sector. So what sector. else? Well, now, uh, at the moment now we are uh, exporting certain kinds of vegetables to the Middle East, for example. Mm. We have started. There was a big uh, news item as well. Now, that's a good opening and that's a good direction where our agricultural sector should be transforming themselves to looking forward to the foreign markets. COVID has created that space as well. The fact that Sri Lanka has come out of COVID in a certain way provides certain uh, uh, opportunity on the one side. On the other side, I think the, the world situation is now changing from uh, uh, the kind of foods that they are consuming, the kind of foods that they want to have and where they want to get it from. The whole value chain is getting a shift now. For example, even some of the, some of the uh, meat products for, no, see, we are not a big, big meat manufacturer. But some of the countries which are providing these uh, 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 supplies yeah. are getting affected. So as a result, people are looking for new areas, new, uh, uh, new locations where they feel comfortable. And uh, um, Mr. Alfonso, what the, the, uh, I'm struggling to get, um, uh, can we put a number? For example, we, we see that in this uh, current water, water on account, that there's about 70 million, I think, for, for education. But that's an interim thing. As a budget, what would the ideal percentage of uh, GDP 
uh, involved for the education sector. Now, there was one time uh, 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 an argument, a slogan, say 6% of the GDP. Yes, but it's never been. It's always been in the low, in the low, right. about a third of that, around two, between two and three percent. The, the reason is, you know, a country that has sort of battered by 30 years of war, there are many sectors that are demanding. Yes, know, we, we can't be forever and a day blaming the war. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm not. I'm not blaming the war. Yeah. What I'm saying is that is a fact of life. We have yes, to. Yes, but we need to look forward. We have to look forward to. When you are looking forward, what it, what I'm trying to say is, you know, when you have a situation where you know you have this kind of disruption that has been in place, yeah. the many things that should have taken place in the country have not taken place. Now that prevented. That, that's not the only reason, but that prevented the enterprises taking the advantage of. A peaceful situation. Yes, we, we know that. Right. But, um, hopefully, uh, as we go into the break and we come back from the break, perhaps you'll be able to tell us um, what next for the future. We've had the Easter bombing attacks. We've had, on top of that, uh, almost in a perverse way, the, the icing on the cake has been the global uh, pandemic. And that clearly has impacted on the economies, not only of uh, our country, but of the entire world. And so, in an effort to look to the future, uh, hopefully, um, Mr. Indrajit Aponso will provide some sort of economic uh, uh, plan, which this government hopefully will, uh, will take on. In the meantime, we're going for a break right now. Don't go away. After all, this is Newsline Live. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. I'm different to you. I'm doing a 100% Middlesex University British degree with no compromise in Sri Lanka. How about you? Call 07 1115 1234 to enroll now. A land in Anavilundava, protected under the Ramsar Convention, now at risk. Attempts made to clear the land for prawn farming. Cabinet approves amendments to income tax and several other taxes. Yana Sarathera of the Our Power of People Party explains what happened to the parliamentary seat. Another accomplice of Angadoloka, arrested with heroin, Worth over 30 million rupees. Governor of the Central Province suspends the mayor of Matale. Investigations launched. Vote an account for the next four months presented in Parliament. I'm different to you. I'm doing a 100% Middlesex University British degree with no compromise in Sri Lanka. How about you? Call 07 1115 1234 to enroll now. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. And welcome back to Newsline Live. We are in conversation with an economist, a senior lecturer at the University of Colombo, is uh, Mr. Indrajit Aponso. Um, Mr. Aponso, so what is uh, the what should uh, the government be doing given the fact that we've got a pandemic all our economy is down uh, some companies doing remarkably being resilient and actually with sound management uh, taking it forward um, lots of people though struggling 62 percent of the working force are unskilled 38% skilled, 30,000 university spa uh, spaces, a student population from the beginning generally between 330 and 360,000. What should we be doing? What is primarily be doing is you're going to get the economy into some pace yes, of... Specifically what ought to be Specifically done. what you could do at the moment is that <clears throat> The traditional sectors are now virtually 
in a standstill. Yeah. Tourism, which is drawing about three to four billion dollars, is in shambles now. Absolutely. And it is not going to recover. Nobody knows. But our exports are doing okay. Well, not or exactly. Not, exactly. not exa th th This is the point. Now, I think the exports, the traditional export sectors, the garments are transforming themselves. Yeah, the tea. What about tea? Teas. No, the, the, the problem with tea is now, I mean, tea can't be taking all the way to creating uh, the, the amount of money that we need. At the moment, we are short of every year more than $11 billion. Right. Unless we plug this gap. That's, you talk about the deficit? That's the trade deficit. That's the imports minus exports. $11 billion. $11 billion. Dollars. Dollars. American dollars. So out of the eleven billion dollars, <coughs> unless if we plug that gap, yeah, we will never be able to get out of so it. So how do we plug that gap? We should plug that gap in a number of different ways. <coughs> Even if we do have economic growth, say for example in two thousand fifteen we had uh, sizable two thousand fourteen, uh, we had sizable growth. But still we had this big gap in the foreign exchange and as long as you have a big gap in the foreign exchange you'll be borrowing from abroad and as long as you're borrowing from abroad <coughs> you are getting into more and more problems so what is to be done is we have to transform every small and medium scale and every co company to move out of this country to export when you say move out, I don't mean that. Quite literally move out. It's, it's not literally moving out, but they have to focus on whatever the opportunity is. So whatever we produce, we must make it export quality, Absolutely. export standards, Absolutely. and follow it up with Absolutely. export. Absolutely. It's not finished products. This is what the other countries have done. You have to plug yourself into the value chain. So it's not just sell, 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 but it's export, export, export. It's not the, it's, it's, what you can do is, you will, should be looking at what are the specific segments that you can yourself plug into. It's because the globalization has created a situation where different countries have been different components. Yeah. So what we need to do is, we have to focus on where, in the industry sector in particular, where, where, where we can really plug ourselves into this value chain uh, 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 process and create a space for export. On the other hand, things like agriculture, I don't think we have explored enough to transform the agriculture from, as you at the beginning said, food security sense to a more cash earning sense. You know, we got to look for more and more cash crops and where the cash crops can come in, it's not the crops per se, the value added forms we have a whole range of uh, especially agricultural commodities which are in high market value outside now for example the, the you take goraka you take kaha now these are of high value added com commodities but here our focus is in domestic economy so what is necessary here is this is where the government has to come in in a big way on the one hand try to help them to create the necessary capacities and scale of production on the other creating trade links creating trade opportunities where these these small economies or these small farms will be able to create opportunities in the export. how important is foreign direct investment Foreign direct investment is uh, at currently in a situation where things are not moving very well. <coughs> are you being polite? Do you really want to say that it's in a state of uh, disrepair? No. Foreign direct investments are necessary, but that's not the f driver of an economy. Driver of the economy comes from your own investors. And we do have a team of investors now who are very capable. So in, in, in which case, what is the role of government then? The role of government is, first, 
the investors must see the profits the investors must see the opportunities which will create their own interest to get into these sectors at the moment the one of the problems is that most of the investors complain not on economic issues but the non economic issues that are hindering their basic process so do you need do you need um amended 19th uh, uh, amended 19th amendment to get on with this no i think this is i don't know i personally believe look at the small things do we need a two thirds majority to do this well i mean i don't want to comment on that you know the thing is you know no, i was asking you on this question no when you want to make investments in in uh, the, uh, an economic investment uh does does which which comes first is it necessary to have to change the constitution to do all that <laughs> well the constitutional aspects are i as i see are there's highly political aspects yeah. but those aspects are not going to drive you into a fast moving economic form mm -hmm. whatever people say what is necessary here there are things that are below that level which are more strategic and operational levels which have to be addressed that probably does not require a high political level uh, uh, changes and revisions but i'm not going to comment on that because i'm not in the uh, on the saddle okay trying, trying to look then, at things uh, let me, let me uh, thank you for sending us your questions uh several uh in there sri lanka should be developed as the gateway to india export to india it can be our world market what do you have to say about that well i i think we have tried this we have tried this we had a, some kind of a trade uh 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 free trade uh, uh, process with india yeah what happens is india is a very complex situation <coughs> indian uh, uh situation did change over time uh, as far as the trade is concerned so i think the most of the sri lankan traders who had tried to exploit indian markets were not very well uh, 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 very well placed after their experiences so india has to play a big role for sri lanka to get them uh, get them to work with them but on the other hand whether sri lanka should be discarding india that's also not the way mm. i mean india is a large economy india many, is after all india india is after all india and india is probably looking at uh, uh, more opportunities after covid with the uh, us playing big games with china and us uh, trade uh, trade rift so that will bring in certain opportunities for india so in that situation we might have opportunities for us to it's not with the indian investors mm. but we might have opportunities with india to have a different kind of trading relationships different kind of trading exchanges to to realize but at the moment i don't see india has played its cards right looking at sri lanka is a small economy 84 billion economy compared to indian massive uh, economy so sri lanka can do very little to influence the thinking and the psyche in india so on the other hand there are political aspects also playing uh, in the background so sort of intertwined in the economy absolutely market. so as a result india is looked upon by the country anything if you give concession to india or allow india to sort of come in this way it will have very political uh, repercussions so there is this particular issue of india sri lanka relationships have to come into a certain level and understanding and then the partnerships have to be rebuilt and uh, m many many questions about uh, or statements actually rather than questions that sri lanka should be trading uh, uh, much more closely with india than they are um, but unfortunately we looks like we are uh, sort of running out of time yeah but that but that question yeah you see it's not a country versus country yeah. trade doesn't do 
between countries. Right. Trading is done by companies. Right. The companies must find the comfort of doing business with another company. And the government's role is to government facilitate, role is facilitate it. So if that is not taking place... So in short, the government has no business to be in business, but the government must be in the business of facilitating. Absolutely. absolutely. Government should be... The, the role of the government should be to create the environment, <clears throat> let people make their own decisions without interfering too much on the process. Because the businesses are the masters of business, not the government. Uh, Mr. Indrajit uh, Aponsa, thank you very much for being on Newsline Live. My uh, pleasure. Thank you so much. And that's the way it was on Newsline Live. Take care. Have a wonderful evening ahead of you. And of course, as always, God bless.